going live, just so you know. Okay, we're live. We should have been playing that Europe song, like it's the final countdown. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that would have been a little bit of a cliche, wouldn't it? <laughs> a little bit. So 1300 sharp, Central European summertime. Let's go. Welcome everybody here at the EuropeDay.eu dedicated website by the European Cultural Foundation and a whole lot of friends to celebrate Europe Day. Europe Day is a day that is not widely celebrated across the continent, even though our continent has been very good for most of us. Plenty of us are living rather well and a lot of people would like to be living in Europe. So we thought, softly influenced by the words of our founders, perhaps we should be celebrating Europe Day just a little more. Last year, when we were hit by surprise by the corona pandemic, we were actually organizing a physical Europa Day event in Amsterdam, the city where we're based. But then of course, corona we decided to take our festivities online and invited befriended networks, grantees, people we work with, people we would like working with to join us on a celebration of Europe Day. That actually proved to be a great success. So for this year, our options were rather simple. We couldn't organize a physical event and we have the website europeday.eu where you are now watching and we are in for a long day of great examples of pan-European networks, institutions, and sometimes even single people trying to make their best to make our continent an even better, more inclusive, more culturally aware, more democratic place. As you might have seen on the website europeday.eu, we are hosting a live stream from exactly one minute ago till eight o'clock this evening and we'll have a series of live streams following each other up for those people that have not yet seen um, underneath this big window you can see all of them lined out we'll have a presentation by networked european media which is a collaboration between various media makers across europe not aiming to invent a new european medium or to replace existing media but exactly as the name says to network them in order to come to a more pan-european medium in that sense we can read across the borders one might say and see certain topics not only from a national lens but from a series of national lenses perhaps contributing to a european lens 
following up after the Network European Media, we'll be having a short presentation on the state of European literature. State of Euro European literature is a annual event in Amsterdam, the city that we're also based, by UNIC Netherlands, the Network of Cultural Institutes, uh, the University of Amsterdam Faculty of Humanities, the Bali and SPI 25. It's quite a special moment because they will be revealing who will be this year's speakers at their event. We'll continue with a presentation by one of our newest programs, the Europe Challenge, a collaboration between seven European libraries, Democratic Society from the United Kingdom and Public Libraries 2030, supported by European Cultural Foundation, looking to connect various European libraries who all have their local challenges that might be actually answered on a meta local level. So seven libraries working together in involving their communities in solving challenges that might be the same all across Europe. Wouldn't that be something that Europe could be about? We're more than curious for their presentation starting at half past two. Then for those people that are following along on the screen, the Grades by Fine X, you might wonder, what is this? The Grades by Fine X is actually a cartoon contest organized by our friends from Fine X in Bulgaria, who invited illustrators from all across the European Union and other countries in Europe to contribute a drawing that would symbolize solidarity in Europe in the times of a pandemic. These cartoons are available for a Creative Commons license online, and you can just use them for your website, your publications, for whatever you like. And if you are an illustrator yourself, you might contribute. Jana Tavanier will be explaining the process, and a few of the illustrators will join her in explaining how the process went. For those people reading along, you will see a greener future for cultural mobility how we all long to actually be traveling again across borders here in Europe, right? Um, but maybe the pandemic taught us a few lessons about mobility and that an endless going around the globe might not just be what our globe needs. So perhaps in this session, the people behind the European Cultural Foundations Consortium in the iPortinus program will discuss how mobility for cultural managers, for cultural actors, might look like once our restrictions for traveling has been lifted. It's a little session starting at four o'clock till five o'clock in the afternoon. Then we have a session offered by the students of European studies at the University of Amsterdam. They are interviewing Professor Joop Leersen, one of the most renowned scholars on European ID history and notions of Europeanness uh, at his university. They have, I don't know how, actually convinced him to an exclusive interview starting at 1700, lasting till 1800. And they'll also take a few of your questions. So if you have any questions on the history of Europe, possible futures of Europe, then maybe this is the moment for you to actually be an active participant because it will lead you right into the European Pavilion on air. The European Pavilion is a program by the European Cultural Foundation, which is a artistic research into what Europe could be as reflected by artists. The name the European Pavilion is a little nod to the pavilions at the Venice Biennale, which are all national pavilions. How weird it is for a almost united continent to still work along national pavilions. Couldn't this be different? Our program manager, Laura Gabier, has collected a whole series of artistic researchers, makers in helping her to look for what could be a European pavilion and what kind of Europe could it represent? It is a program that the European Cultural Foundation carries out together with Cultura Nova Foundation and the Camargo Foundation. And that's quite a premiere in this one hour because the new European Pavilion podcast will be premiered. Quite a treat, indeed. We'll be closing off today with the Citizens Takeover Europe, 
the citizens take over is a coalition of almost 50 European organizations that have seized upon the opportunity that the Conference on the Future of Europe by the European Union offers to bring their voices forward to actually stress that if the European Union is organizing a conference on the future of Europe, perhaps this should not be a consultation top down, but it should be a real bottom top initiative where citizens input on what they think the future of the European Union could look like. They have been hosting a series of events over last week under the banner Europe Week, and we are very honored to actually re-host one of their sessions, the one of first day, May 6th. So this will be our live stream, but this is not all that you will find on the website. As perhaps you would like to see with me, you can scroll down on the web page. I can share a screen so you can just see. There are a whole series of windows that you can just visit on the website. The citizens take over, I just mentioned them. They have collective, new kind of media. I suppose I should not explain you that if you click on the title, then actually a new page opens, right? Thank you. There's a whole lot of links in here. Actually, the europeday.eu website is a treasure for clicking your way around Europe. Common Ground, the annual magazine by the European Cultural Foundation, looking for common European ground to celebrate our continent. It's the second year we publish Common Ground as our annual magazine. It's quite a treat. It's 180 pages. So even if you are listening to the live stream, you might be flipping through the pages of this beautifully designed magazine. Then, as mentioned, there is the Conference on the Future of Europe kicking off today by the European institutions. If you click on that window, you might be joining their live streams too. Of course, I recommend you to not do so, but just stay in our window, but it's good for you to know, right? Then, as you might know, the European Cultural Foundation, Europa Nostra and Cultural Action Europe has been campaigning for a cultural deal for Europe in all the recovery plans that the European Union has agreed to and that many European nation states actually delivered their plans last week to the European Union, there wasn't a lot of attention on culture. The three organizations and more than 100 co-signatories of the campaign actually claim that 2% of the budgets of the recovery fund should be dedicated to culture. There are a series of events taking place in national capitals over the upcoming weeks and you will find a little bit more of explanation in this window. Daring New Spaces is a program by the Progressive Centrum in Berlin. It wants to identify current challenges to develop guiding principles for how our European public sphere of the future could look like. Disruptive Fridays, by accident, also based in Berlin, is a digital media collective that has been hosting a weekly talk show called Disruptive Friday on all things digital media. There are a whole series of their YouTube programs available if you just click on the link. Europa Festival is an ambitious idea by a Dutch retired businessman that wants to actually have street parades in European capitals starting in 2023. How fantastic would it be if we would have a let's say love parade, but then not a love parade, but a Europe parade in Berlin or a techno festival in Paris. Um, he's still looking for people to join him. Click Europa Festival if you feel like doing so. The Europe Challenge, as introduced before, is one of the European Cultural Foundation's programs working together with democratic society libraries across Europe. Europe Day Live is a dedicated website, just like this one where a whole series of national acts are performing songs in closed music venues. But like this, you can still make a musical trip around the continent. This offered to you by the ABU, European Broadcasting Union and Live Europe. Excuse me. <coughs> then if you are a bit bored with sitting behind a computer all day long, we invite you to go outside. There's plenty of Europe in your own surroundings too. These European Lieu de Mémoire are not only those buildings with a European Union flag, but could be anything that has to do with European heritage. 
Europe Day walks invite you to actually look at these European buildings and perhaps capture them. Perhaps you can share them on social media and even add what you think that Europe could be looking like. I know that we're never ever going to be able to finish this complete list of contributors because in two minutes we're going to start with our first session on Network European Media. So after that first session, I'll be back for a short introduction on all the other programs that are listed here. I will just be screening, so you scrolling, so you can just be seeing for yourself. You see, this Europe Day ain't over yet. Um, we hope it's a beginning for even bigger Europe Day festivities over the upcoming years. Because if there's something that Europe might need in order to be a continent where everybody is happy to participate, have their say, it could be that we should be creating a little bit more of a European sentiment altogether. According to the European Cultural Foundation, Europe Day is one of the means to actually do so. And it's not for nothing that on the website, we echo the words of one of the founders of European Cultural Foundation. Allow me to actually look it up because I don't want to make any mistakes in quoting. That would be sad, wouldn't it? And sometimes like this, when computers are slow, so Robert Schumann said, Europe will not be made all at once or according to a single plan. It will be built through concrete achievements which first create a de facto solidarity. We hope you enjoy, enjoy Europe Day a lot and that enjoying this day will actually be a little step towards more concrete solidarity on our continent. Enjoy the day. And then allow me to actually head over to that first session on Network European Media, which my colleague Ashley Thompson, I don't know if you can see her. Yes, yeah, she's waving at you. You might all wave back, we don't see you, but it just feels friendly, right? We'll be moderating a discussion with a few people involved in the Network European Media project. Ashley, maybe you can reveal who you'll be speaking with. Yes, so in this Network European Media, we will be speaking with Menno, um, who's in charge of the uh, Network European Media project, as well as Zemos98, as well as Mick from Are We Europe, and as well as Natalie Nugarade. So this is a Spanish network, a fellow researching European media. Natalie Nugarade was also the founder of the Europe Now newsletter at The Guardian, and are we Europe, the magazine that a whole lot of you might have heard of. And actually, <laughs> my computer is on a bunch of our Europe magazines. So hoping things are not dropping. Ah, no. uh, that's a shitty thing with these backgrounds. Um, never mind. I think we're all set for a 45-minute discussion on Network European Media. Ashley, will you take it away? Yes. Thank you, Friso. See you guys in the next session. Thank you. <laughs> I should probably switch off the live stream now. Okay. Welcome everyone to the Network European Media session for Europe Day 21. As part of the initiative for the European public space, ECF is building a coalition to shape a European media landscape. Together with journalists, researchers, and concerned citizens, we are drawing and testing a blueprint for a network Network European media model based on public values and independent from both market and government. This now leads me to have my first question with Menno on why does ECF want to strengthen European public space? Uh, thank you, Ashley, and uh, thanks for everyone watching. Um, well, I think European, or well, let's start in general, uh, public space. What is it and why is it important? I think uh, public space is at the heart of a uh, democracy, uh, generally, as also Habermas uh, stated, the German philosopher, we need, uh, in a functioning dem democracy, we need a space that is independent from, from the political decision-making process, but also from independent from the market where uh, citizens can meet each other, uh, debate uh, how society looks like, should look like, how you imagine the future, sharing culture, negotiate how uh, we live together, uh, how we interact. And uh, this space 
is uh, very important because, first of all, it kind of molds the political uh, uh, decision-making process. It, it kind of brings uh, the, the, the debate in society, uh, brings together the, the building blocks for the actual process of uh, political decision-making, and also it shapes uh, our shared identity. And I think it's important uh, that this happens also at the European level. First of all, I think it's always important to know what's going on, uh, know your neighbors. It's always important to, to know what's going on in, in other countries, uh, but specifically Europe, because Europe is somehow a political entity, um, or not somehow, it is a political entity with a democracy, with a parliament, with, uh, with uh, uh, decision-making processes going on. And if this is not supported by a debate in society, uh, it will be very detached uh, from the actual uh, consciousness of citizens, or to say it in more simple words, you don't know what's going on in Brussels. Same time, Europe is also uh, a market, uh, free markets. Uh, so it is already an economic entity as well. Uh, the, the business world is interconnected. Uh, trade can take place between countries without any limitations. But what's missing is the space where citizens can interact. And so on one hand, you have the political decision-making process also referred to as the Brussels bubble. Then you have the business world. But uh, the place where we actually debate how society looks like uh, is uh, not existing or very weak, at least. And uh, this is problematic uh, for uh, democracy. And what does ECF do to strengthen European public space? Well, European public space uh, is a space that uh, exists uh, in, in, in different uh, shapes and forms. There's physical spaces uh, that uh, we try to support, the spaces where free debate can take place, uh, spaces where physical spaces where citizens can come together and, and talk with policymakers or with each other uh, to shape their uh, direct environment, but also how that translates into Europe. We do the program VAHA, which is a program for physical cultural spaces where uh, in countries where uh, freedom of speech is, is very much under pressure. Uh, this is a collaboration between Turkey and other countries in Europe, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. We have uh, done a project uh, <clears throat> called uh, Cultural and Creative uh, Spaces and Cities, which is about uh, the spaces where, uh, where citizens can interact with uh, policymakers and shape uh, how uh, culture uh, or how uh, their city looks like. And we call those spaces homes of commons, but a very important part of the uh, public space is also in uh, the digital environment and in the media. And uh, that is what we are going to talk uh, about today uh, because media are a vital element of the public space because uh, everyone uh, watches it, uh, a lot of people contribute to it and media currently is uh, mainly either nationally organized, we have the big national broadcasters, the newspapers, the legacy media that are in a certain language and aimed at, a, at an audience in one country. On the other hand, there's also social media, but those social media are in the hands of, uh, are owned by big tech companies and their algorithms uh, kind of decides what we uh, see and, and watch and, and think. Uh, however, these algorithms are focused on uh, profit maximization, not on creating a space where uh, debates can take place in society, uh, which uh, kind of uh, uh, which is kind of toxic for the space uh, we want to have if it's owned by by companies that have another aim. Uh, with their spaces. And thirdly, the third problem with the, the media space we have in Europe is that it's very exclusive. There is a much imbalance. Margin, marginalized groups are hardly represented. The, you see mainly the ones that are 
uh, in power positions. And uh, we would like to make that media more inclusive. And uh, we do that in different ways. Uh, there's, we did an open call uh, for uh, uh, strengthening public space, which was called, called Culture of Solidarity in Times of an Infodemic. And in that open call, we were looking for uh, projects and initiatives that uh, either contribute to cross-border media co collaboration or that uh, help to develop tools uh, that could be building blocks for a digital uh, European public space. Or we were looking for projects that uh, produce storytelling to convince why European public space uh, is important. And this is uh, both directed at uh, policymakers uh, as well as the general audience. So that's one thing we do. On the other hand, we also uh, do collaboration projects that is kind of uh, uh, leading by example. Uh, we have a project called Media Activism where Felipe will talk more about, which is about the right to the city and the way uh, local activists can use uh, do-it-yourself produced media to highlight issues related to the right to the city in Europe and connecting those spaces uh, across the continents. And uh, we support a lot of other projects that are uh, uh, contributing to uh, European media space. And we do this uh, through uh, partnerships and grants uh, because we think a lot of uh, a lot of the projects happening already, a lot of the organizations that are out there have a great potential to contribute uh, to European public space, but they do not have the capacity and the outreach to uh, uh, reach the millions of uh, Europeans that they would need uh, to reach. So uh, we, by supporting them, we hope to increase their uh, capacity and to in increase their outreach. Thank you, Mano. And some more examples here on projects that support why media is particularly important um, and European public space is important is the Summer of Solidarity. Natalie, can you tell us something more about the Summer of Solidarity? Yes, hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi. Um, happy Europe Day, everybody. It's nice to be here. And um, um, so Summer of Solidarity was a project that, that launched uh, last spring and was actually um, a pop-up journalism uh, initiative involving um, uh, over 40 partners from across Europe and a young youngish group of uh, journalists and editors and creators and what the whole um, thinking behind it and I was I was delighted to take part in this as well as uh, Mick who's, who's on this in this discussion and will join us later um, I was just, just delighted to take part in it because if you remember back to May 2020, we were in lockdown situations across Europe and um, the idea was let's, um, let's uh, do something which goes against the very notion of lockdown and isolation and let's connect uh, with each other across Europe through the sharing, the collecting and sharing of, um, of human stories. It was really a storytelling journalistic project. So there's a, a website that everybody can look at, it's still up, it's summerofsolidarity.eu. And it was multi-format video, text, photo. Um, we had big and small media involved. It was a network of, uh, a collaborative network of media outlets, sometimes very small ones, um, uh, of individual freelancers, um, and of civil society networks, citizens, uh, groupings and platforms. And it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. When I look back at, it, at what we did, it lasted for two months. Uh, it was online and producing and publishing for two months from the 20th of June to the 20th of August. And when I look back at that collection of over a hundred uh, items of content, as we say, you know, journalism, stories, podcasts, um, videos, I think it's a beautiful uh, photography kind of documentation of an extraordinary summer. And I, what, I, what I think was important about this project, which ECF, the European Cultural Foundation supported, 
as well as Hippocrène uh, Foundation based in France and also the Robert Bosch uh, Foundation through a fellowship that I was on at the time. Uh, what, it, what it wanted to do was um, show that we can, uh, you know, even uh, in a very swift way and uh, in a very concrete way, we can uh, set up these, this idea, this notion of a, a networked European media made of different entities, not one centralized thing, but a, a sort of grassroots connected um, uh, a platform, if you will, of, of uh, creators and editors uh, and funders. So that, that was Summer of Solidarity and everything was in the name, Summer of Solidarity. Shall I show a quick uh, video? Natalie asked me to share my screen. Sure. Thanks for that. Thanks for the showing the video. Um, perhaps I'll just jump in to say one last thought, one one uh, more thought, which is that actually there's a there's a what I find fascinating when we think about a European public sphere and a, a, a new way of envisaging a, a European across European media landscape. Um, what I see is not just all the difficulties because we know media organizations are you know having a rough time and journalists and freelancers are, are sometimes struggling. What I see is there's a lot of creativity and there's a lot of energy uh, to create more and um, uh, lots of things are burgeoning, lots of things are appearing on the European media landscape. And I think that's connected to the emergence of a actual um, European civil society and an actual uh, European public sphere. Um, uh, and this is new. I don't think it existed in this same way 10 years ago. It's connected to many reasons. I'll just name two. I think we we are um, all more, much, much more aware of how we need to exchange information and exchange among each other and learn more about each other and listen to each other. We're much more aware of that because we have gone through so many crises. So that's the the silver lining and all these crises, and still we're in the pandemic crisis, but as you know, there were many crises in the previous large decade. Uh, that's the silver lining. We know that the pertinent dimension is the cross-continental dimension, connecting the local to the continental through the regional and the national. So that's the first reason. Another reason is we have the digital tools for this. They didn't exist in the same way, uh, if, if only a decade ago. And then I do think that, you know, being French, I say this with great ease. I think that we do have a lingua franca. We can do, we can work and build uh, teams using uh, the, uh, you know, the, the lingua franca, which is English. And then uh, showcase the diversity of our linguistic landscape as well. But at least we have this tool of English to do many things. Um, and on that note, I just wanted to say that uh, there's a big creativity out there. Just to, to repeat that, I won't list all the uh, young, you know, digital uh, media initiatives that are appearing. Uh, um, but I'll, I will name one, which is Sfera, and uh, this is to pass the, the baton of the conversation to my to my friend uh, Mick, who who will tell you about Sfera. It's one example, but a very vivid. Uh, example of uh, of this new media creativity, cross European media creativity. Hi, hi everyone. Mick calling in from the Netherlands. Thanks, Natalie, for that. I hope my internet is strong enough because I've really tried to boost everything here. Okay, good. Well, uh, thanks for the, those notes, and Natalie. As Menno also said at the start, uh, we also in our projects, and I, I had uh, the pleasure to work with many of the people here. Uh, on the Summer of Solidarity project last summer, but also we saw that a lot of media and especially independent, small, alternative media, uh, it's very difficult to look across borders and collaborate. Um, and therefore we, we wanted to also, in one project, look at the next generation of Europeans, Gen Z and beyond as it's often called, um, and try to 
make a collaborative project between media partners and all independent and alternative media all across the European continent. So Sfera was born. Um, it's a pilot project, a year-long pilot project, um, video first, digital first, social first, um, and stories from young Europeans uh, across the continent. It's a collaborative new media project, about eight media partners, uh, small and big, from across the continent, um, from the north to the south to the east to the west, uh, they've joined. And basically what we're saying is, hey, these are videos created by young storytellers, um, young Europeans all across the continent. You can use this content, so you don't have to produce it yourself. Um, it's, it's something that you can take from our, our website, post on your own channels, and there's also all these media um, who have joined and who make their own content and post it as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a catalog, it's a living dossier of video stories that's constantly being, constantly being replenished um, by young European video makers and podcast makers uh, across the continent. We also host live events. There's festivals with our friends from We Are Europe um, all across the continent as well. So it's really cool to see, to see this happening. And, and myself as the founder of Are We Europe, the magazine that Frisa also talked about in the beginning, uh, we very, very much believe in collaborative media projects as the future for uh, European the European media space. So that's why we're, we're so happy to be, uh, to be part of this network media effort, uh, which the ECF is spearheading. So thanks for that. Uh, there's also a one minute video uh, showing this, um, the, the, the thoughts of Gen Sets. So we asked them, what does the future look like to you? And this is what they answered. Le futur, c'est prendre en compte la parole des minorités et se rendre compte que le monde n'est pas réservé qu'aux blancs. Najważniejsze w przyszłości jest urzeczywistnianie swoich planów i marzeń. Zukunft ist, wenn die gläserne Decke endlich durchbrochen werden kann und es gleiche Chancen für alle gibt. Für mich ist Futuro ein Success, Bacci, Felicità. Zukunft ist, wenn wir nicht mehr darüber reden müssen, dass homosexuelle Männer vom Blutspendeverbot ausgeschlossen werden. Der Futuro war, die Salarien und die Chancen für die Jungen. Für mich ist der Futuro, um zu viajar im Mund und zu kennen andere Kulturen. Der Futuro ist, when my intersectional identity is fully embraced and accepted in our society. El futuro es trabajar para que no sean las empresas las que determinen nuestra precariedad. Przyszłość to coś, co nie wszyscy będziemy mieli i miały ze względu na pogarszający się stan naszej planety. Le futur c'est l'économie circulaire. The future is about hope, opportunity and a better place for our children. Yes, thanks for showing that. I'll just say that um, we're on uh, Sfera now, it's called, is the handle on almost every social media from TikTok to YouTube to Facebook to Twitter. Um, as you can hear, we produce content in six different languages. So we want to, of course, use English as a, as a language of communication for the next generation, but also show that there's local stories to be told. Um, I think it's, really, it's a really cool project. So please uh, keep an eye out and uh, yeah, follow us on all those channels. Thank you so much, Mick, for sharing about the Sphere project and shedding some lights on some examples of European indie or digital media environment. Um, I'd like to pass this uh, baton on to Zemos98, who calls themselves cultural mediators. Felipe, can you explain what that, what that means and explain more about your work with Zemos98? Hello, Wesley. Thank you so much and happy Europe Day to everyone. It's raining here in Seville, but I don't think that's a sign of anything. So uh, we, we can just skip that data. And, and yeah, when we, when we talk about mediation, we mean being in between, uh, being in between of different languages, contexts, uh, profiles, formats, uh, uh, experiences. And one of the things we have been trying to do is to build uh, through participatory processes, uh, spaces or places in which collaboration can take place. Uh, we have been collaborating on a European level and, and especially with the ECF for 10 years now uh, in many different communities, networks and, and processes. We have made mistakes, of course. I think it's important to share that. But there are many, many lessons learned and we would like to implement them uh, through this new experience that we are building together. Uh, one of the examples of what we have been doing recently is a project called Media Activism. Uh, media activism basically aims to connect young citizens working on, on the right to the city through media uh, to foster more livable public spaces. 
better housing conditions or measures to struggle against uh, climate change. Uh, it consists of a series of activities happening in different cities of Europe. A hack camp, which is a format of uh, an encounter oriented to face challenges by designing prototypes that give an answer to the needs of uh, the local context of every uh, hub. A ride to the city laboratory, uh, where a group of diverse participants uh, try to implement a campaign claiming the demands of citizenship and a policy fora to foster changes in our cities, policies uh, regarding the right to the city. Uh, we will have, and this is uh, very important to, to share today, uh, the European Hackam in two weeks uh, that will gather the expanded European community of the project to connect and scale up the different learnings produced so far. Uh, we are going to show now one of the, the, the outputs of the project. It's a, it's a short video. Uh, it's called We in, in Sweden. It's a documentary produced by the Swedish partner Fanzingo uh, in the frames of media activism, of course. And uh, uh, Elena Kaya, a young journalist, and Patrick Asplund, an anti-fascist uh, activist, visit different places and interview people with different perspectives to discover new underlying realities. Uh, we in Sweden portrays the need of a media public sphere that acknowledges a calm and caring debate about those important things that rarely make, uh, make it into the news, which is what we are to, uh, trying to do uh, here. So I'm gonna show the video. If I say Sweden, what images come to your mind? Perhaps this? I shouldn't be up here. I should be back in school on the other side of the ocean. You're ready. I'm all messed up. I'm so out of line. And so he hits the ball and it goes in. Slatan Ibrahimovic does three goals. Or maybe this. You look at what's happening last night in Sweden. Sweden. Who would believe this? Sweet! Sweden decided to keep schools and businesses open. The argument is Sweden managed to stay open during the pandemic, so why can't we? The young journalist Elena received numerous threats from right wingers and neo Nazis after her appearance in a video series on social media. Säkert som kunde garantera mig inkomst och stabilitet. Men jag lyssnar inte. This interested Patrick, a man well known on the streets of Stockholm, for should we say different reasons. Tidigare, tillbaka. Ja, det kommer. Det var någon grön du bara highlighted. Typ. Ja, det kommer. Det var liksom 20-30 000 plattor som såldes med våra liksom, texter och bevara Sverige svenskt och allting. Det var ju människor som begick John Ron-mordet, alltså kodemordet, klippamordet, massa sådana grejer. Vi var en del av en rörelse för att skapa liksom, det här hatet och konflikterna som ledde till att människor dog. Och det får man ju leva med. Liksom. Så det är fortfarande liksom så här, ja, känslomässigt jobbigt liksom, att få leva efter. Liksom, så, att, så är det. Så är det. Uh, it was good before, but it's not good anymore. To feel the love for our country and the love for our people. Thank you a lot, Felipe, for sharing that video. And this leads to my question on, there are a lot of interesting projects, um, but overall overreach, uh, outreach is limited and the media is still very much nationally organized. How can we change this? Can I give this to Menno or to anyone else who would like to? Yeah, sure, to, to everyone, but I can give a first uh, attempt of an answer. And I think this is already an example. We see here a video from Sweden, it's still very, focused on Sweden and it's interesting because this is also going beyond filter bubbles of course because we have here this uh, ex neo nazi talking with uh, with the journalist that uh, feels excluded 
and uh, in it's a way of starting a conversation uh, between two people of uh, coming from uh, different worlds. Um, but what we do here in media activism, but also in network European media that I will come to talk about right after this is to uh, connect all those different stories that take place in one local reality in a neighborhood, in a city, in a country, in a region, uh, connect all those stories to each other, which means this video uh, from Sweden can be shown at the film festival probably at the moment online, but maybe next year, a film festival in Sevilla. And in this way, without creating some kind of Brussels style, uh, centralized European medium, but by a decentralized approach, we do create a European public sphere because we get a better understanding of what's going on in another reality. And uh, this is one example, media activism, but we try uh, the, in the past uh, roughly uh, half a year, we've kickstarted the process in which we uh, try to set something like that up, but on a much bigger scale that could in a few years, let's say before the next European elections, uh, reach out to millions uh, of people. And again, not to create a new media, but by networking different media uh, to create a decentralized but shared European public sphere. Because what we don't have is this debate discussing the shared interest of what it is in Europe, uh, what it is about in Europe. When we see something in a certain country about another country, it's always from the perspective of that country. And like, what do, if it's about politics in Europe, it's what does, for example, the Netherlands negotiate out of this uh, EU summit in Brussels. It's never about how do we make Europe better by having these conversations. And that's why uh, looking at the partners we were already working with, that includes uh, uh, the partners in media activism, that includes the partners in culture, uh, sorry, Summer of Solidarity, Are We Europe, and all their partners again, uh, to come together uh, and to discuss like how can we bring this uh, thinking uh, to the next level and how can we create a real European networks uh, media. And uh, this was a process in which about 10, uh, what we called ambassadors for European public sphere came together. They had several workshops together, online workshops in which we kind of thought about like, how can we organize this? How should it look like? How do we make decisions if we work with all those media together? And uh, how do we get there? What are the steps in order to, uh, uh, to have that uh, ready uh, in the next few years? And that's uh, resulted in a pilot that is now, uh, that is now um, kind of uh, driven by uh, our Europe, or actually I should say collective, which is Natalie, which is Ari Europe, but it's also their whole network of media organizations as what we call an editorial team. And Zemos as a so-called networking team, they do the cultural mediation, let's say between all these media makers. But to go one step back, what uh, did this ambassadors for European public sphere uh, discuss? Well, I think I can tell you, but I can also show a short videos in, in which some of them will say what they think is important to see back and uh, in a, a European media and uh, which values are at the foundation of uh, such uh, media. So I have it ready. I almost clicked on leave instead of share screen. Uh, I have it ready here. And we see several of the networks European of the ambassadors for network European media or for European public space, actually. The European Cultural Foundation is building a coalition to shape a European media landscape. Together with journalists, researchers, and concerned citizens, we are drawing and testing a blueprint for a network European media model based on public values and independent from both market and government. On the longer term, this model should receive public funding from European institutions. We need a media, I believe, that is collaborative, pan-European, truly diverse, a media that reflects all of us in Europe. 
If the inhabitants of Europe are to live together in peace and solidarity with each other, it is crucial Europe has a public space where citizens, including the ones not formally recognized as such, are sharing perspective, discussing differences of opinion, and producing shared culture. Media are a vital element for such a space. We live in Europe and stories don't stop at national borders. That's why it's really important that journalists collaborate across borders and listen also to voices from the peripheries. And that's exactly what a European network media can do. Bold and dynamic new media popping up in Brussels, in the EU member states and in the EU's near neighborhood, which is going to be such a big part of the continent's future. Being European has multiple layers. I come from Amsterdam, I'm Dutch and I feel European. Europe is a multi-layered system, and any effort at a network media should reflect that. If Europe is to contend with the myriad crisis the continent faces, then we need a truly networked European media that is beyond the national echo chambers that advances democratic and progressive value. Do we know each other all that well across Europe? Our memories, our family stories, our life experiences. Having a media initiative that would help us see that and share those stories and those realities and have a shared set of facts, um, that would help us find solutions for the future. And we need solutions and we can build solutions and be more optimistic. Do you want to reimagine a new media free of hate and open to new ways of being? Please join us in this mission. Yeah, and we also saw our dear moderator going back in the uh, video. So that's nice how the circle is round. So to summarize, what kind of media do we want? We want one that's, uh, first of all, European. Well, I think we talked enough about that. We want a media that's inclusive. I mean, Habermas was talking about European public sphere, but he also uh, gave as an example how in the 18th century uh, people came together in coffee houses and discussed society. But of course, in those coffee houses, it's not like everyone was coming there. The working class, for example, wasn't really attending this coffee house. So something also fundamentally different should happen to include marginalized groups uh, in society, such as uh, migrants and refugees, uh, uh, LGBT. QI communities, uh, but also young people, for example, and, and, and women. So this is something uh, that is really important and at the core of this initiative, how to make it diverse and how to give equal access to everyone living in Europe, not only European citizens in a legal sense, but everyone, also the ones formerly not recognized as citizens, to take part in society. So that's the second. The third one is that we think it should be multi-layered. That's the reality. That's also the 21st century. It's, uh, it's kind of uh, a decentralized system, fits better with also the way uh, Europe works and how we live together. We have multiple uh, identities, as Mick said uh, in the video. So it's about connecting the local uh, to the other local, connecting the local to the European, speaking to both the center uh, as well as the periphery. And the third one, uh, or fourth, if you include European, is that it should be based on public value. So it's not profit driven, it's not algorithms that are there in order to earn as much money as possible, but it's the function that such a media could have to strengthen our democracy that is important. And that's why we also think that in the end, this deserves uh, not necessarily our initiative, but a network European media deserves public funding, in which should be, of course, uh, be very uh, independent. The, 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 the funding should be very independent from the decision making. So, if uh, the European Union wants to fund an initiative like this, it needs also policy to make sure that it's owned by the media and by the citizens, maybe also by the readers and the viewers. But the funding uh, is coming from uh, public sources, which uh, would create a kind of public civic partnership. So those are the elements we are working towards. We're starting now, still relatively small, but it uh, will grow. And uh, in a few years, we have this kind of uh, media that uh, uh, connects different local realities to each other. and. Uh, enables uh, public debate on a European level. And just some examples of how this works in practice um, of 
network to European media. Uh, Felipe, could you tell us something about the networking team? Yeah, I said before that uh, we made mistakes in the past, but uh, regarding the lessons learned, I could say that, uh, you know, it's obvious to, to, to say, it, but mainstream media builds power and there are many displaced voices and marginalized stories, suppressed communities. And apart from uh, the fact that we need to acknowledge that, uh, we need to act, act in consequence. So uh, one of the things we would like to do is to build spaces in which collaboration can take place to scale up these stories, these uh, uh, things that we uh, don't see so often on the mainstream media. Uh, of course, to do that, apart from taking the time to know each other, to listen truly to, to each other, uh, we need to set up a series of methodologies, workshops, spaces in which uh, cooperation or co-creation or collaboration can take place. So that's going to be uh, our main role, uh, finding the difference, but also similarities between the, the partners and, and all the communities around uh, the ECF, because that's one of the things we should value, that we have many people trying to do the same, which is to foster this kind of uh, transformative, but small stories. So the idea is to uh, uh, build a network of networks uh, in which we can scale up all these stories and we will do our best uh, with me, Natalie, Meno, and all the people involved uh, in this new stage uh, to achieve that. Thank you. For maybe just day. to add, oh, yeah. uh, sorry, Ashley, maybe just to add, I think it's also, uh, so we start now mainly with the kind of grassroots media initiatives that are there all over Europe, but uh, on the mid-long term, I, we hope very soon, we have already some involved, we hope that also the, let's say, more traditional media see why this is important and which join this uh, coalition of, uh, of network European media. And Natalie, could you also tell us um, something about the collective news newsletter as an example? Yes, thanks, Ashley. Um, I, I wanted to add to um, just to you know confirm everything that was said earlier. I think um, uh, Felipe and Mano and Nick uh, you know shared some really some thoughts that I completely agree with. And I also wanted to say that um, uh, anybody who's involved in this uh, search for that kind of way of getting informed and getting connected across Europe is, is very welcome to, to contact, contact us through, through the SCF or any other, any other way. Um, and also I wanted to throw in that, you know, there are many, there are other people involved. It's not just us on this call. Uh, this is a great group, but indeed there's, there's a wide diversity of people who are interested, involved in some way or another in the discussion, more girls and women also. Um, and um, if and also I wanted to, to commend the ECF. I do want to say this, and not just because I'm on this call and not just because they supported uh, what, we're, what we've, we're, we're doing now and what we're trying to do and what we've done uh, last year with Summer Solidarity. But I, I, what I like about what CF is the way CF is thinking about this and the way their team is approaching this is there's a commitment. There's a commitment to this idea, and it's not it's not gonna it's not something that will be created just in you know in the snap of a finger. It's going to be a process, and I think that um, there's a wide open avenue for this. I think it's the greatest ambition and the greatest adventure in, in journalism in Europe for this decade. I think in in a few years' time, perhaps at the end of the decade, perhaps much earlier, it's going to be so obvious to all of us that yes, we of course we have a cross European, trans European media environment with many things to choose. From from within that environment, but we won't have only the national media and and or only the global you know global media who uh, who who don't necessarily think in terms of a European common you know awareness. And I think that's really essential. And I think it's coming. It's going to come because the new generation is here. And again, as I said um, before, just watch the civil society debates in Europe. They are no longer uh, only limited to national silos. Uh, they're no longer limited to Brussels institutions. They're much wider. They're much richer than that, and they're going to grow. Um, and to to end on your on your question, Ashley, um, the the project in one sentence is it, it's kind of a pilot project that we're building uh, and researching for together with Felipe, Mick, and others 
And it's, uh, it, it will take as a starting point the notion of a collection of personalized newsletters. So we're using the tool of the newsletter because it engages readers and people directly. But it will be uh, reader engagement, personal voices, a collection of voices, different topics from across the continent, not just the EU. And so watch this space. I won't, um, you know, it's in, in, in the making and uh, we've got resources, early resources for it, but we'll be building more resources. It's going to be a coalition of uh, friends, basically, and reaching out across uh, all sorts of boundaries. I'll stop there. But um, again, you know, thanks for listening. Well said, Natalie. Thank you so much to Felipe, Mick, Natalie, and Menno for shedding light on the Network European Media Initiative and all the projects that are involved with this, Zamos 98, um, and also summer, uh, shedding light on Summer of Solidarity. Thank you all so much. Um, Menno, is there any last um, remarks or comments you'd like to make on where they can watch this space or well, the, the space questions? comes to you the space comes to you because it's a newsletter for now maybe in the future there will be also other spaces where this will be shared and it's also about uh, sharing each other's uh, content of course like a medium in a neighborhood of uh, stockholm uh, can be also uh, be shared uh, in a, a Paris newspaper, so to say. Uh, but if you are interested uh, and you want to join us, by the way, we also connected this call. So a lot of people who apply to the call of culture of solidarity in terms of an infodemic will also be asked to contribute uh, to this network, but also anyone else interested can join, uh, just drop me an email or uh, to Felipe or Nick or Natalie, and uh, we will see how uh, we can collaborate with you. But we are open for as many voices as possible to make uh, this really big and make this, uh, as Natalie called it, uh, the biggest uh, revolution in, uh, in media. You didn't use those words, but uh, that's how it translated. Uh, of the past uh, of the past uh, century, <laughs> something like that. So thank you, Ashley, for having us. And thank you, guys. Uh, let's go to the next session. Yes, thank you all.